Um, fine. So if if I can start the meeting now, uh, there may be some people coming still. Uh, uh, there has been a bit of confusion as to uh, where the lecture is. So I think for most of the people here, Rada needs no introduction. Uh, but for those who weren't at the lecture which she, she gave a couple of weeks ago, I should say that this lecture is one of four lectures that she is giving, coming at the end of her uh, teaching career in Exeter. Um, and uh, it is, from my point of view, a great pleasure to be introducing this because Rada uh, has been here and was very much part of uh, the teaching process in the Institute for, is it now 10 years, Rada, when you first Nine. came? Nine. Nine. Yes. And in fact, when she first came, she was teaching on a course which uh, I believe I was jointly teaching with you at that time. Uh, so it's been wonderful to see how that has developed and how the interest in, in the issue of Israel, Israel and Palestine has developed. Um, with regard to the topic today, uh, it's of note that in, I think it was 1997, Ithaca Press, uh, published an edited book by Rada, which was called Jerusalem Today, What Future for the Peace Process? Uh, and I suppose one of the depressing things today is that title remains as re relevant now as it was then, and I suppose you could even say as relevant 40 years ago as it is today. It remains with us. Uh, Rada, as someone who's been involved in this is issue from a personal point of view, from a political point of view, and from an academic point of view, is someone who we're privileged to have talk on it. Rada. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tim, for that introduction. I wish you had been present at, I know you were away at the first lecture, because for those who were present then, you might remember that I actually talked about the course on Israel-Palestine that I was teaching, which I, I described as inherited from, <laughs> from <laughs> Professor de Bloch. Um, now, today's lecture is not actually inherited from anybody. I, I, I devised the module while I was here. Um, on um, what I'm sure you all agree with me is an extremely important subject, the subject of Jerusalem. Um, now, our, f our, f our first slide here, and I'm t I really am not happy in this lecture theatre. I'm really sorry that we've been re relocated to here because it's distancing and it feels as if uh, it's not right. Uh, the, the, you know. However, let's see, maybe the third lecture will not be like that. And if I tell you that the third lecture will be on the disease of love, then I think you might agree that we need to have a quite a different <laughs> venue for it. Anyway, um, Jerusalem. Now, um, you people will recall that when I gave the first talk, I was uh, the, the 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 subject was teaching uh, the, the this Israel Palestine problem situation. Uh, given the, how the difficulties of doing it because of the, the existence of a different narrative, an alternative narrative, and where every fact was disputed. Uh, and it was really, it's quite a struggle to be able to teach the subject. Now, Jerusalem, I assure you, is not much different <laughs> to the, the first topic because uh, this is a city um, which has aroused in, in, in huge passions in people throughout the ages, but very particularly with uh, the Zionist project, which came to the land of Palestine, and you know how that was established, and so on. Now, the first slide shows you what, uh, let me see, I'm going to try and dim these, and I hope nobody falls asleep. 
um, and if that's too dim, just tell me. Anyway, um, this first slide shows you what I think you would all agree is the face of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. No matter what claims are made, and uh, religious affiliations and so on, this is the kind of unchanging uh, and very beautiful face of Jerusalem in everybody's mind, of course, the, the Dome of the Rock. Um, now, uh, really, I can only describe it as a battle for Jerusalem. Uh, why? Why a battle? Because for the first, not for the first time, uh, in, in, our, in our times, in our age, uh, the, the, the imperative has been from the Zionist project to uh, establish a Jewish state in Palestine has been very much, uh, has involved Jerusalem because of the need to validate the Jewish claim, n n not, so, not only to the land itself, but very much to Jerusalem, which is a very, uh, a, a, a city of imp huge spiritual importance in Judaism. And so as a result of this, what you then had was uh, the, the creation of the idea of something called a Jewish Jerusalem. That is a Jerusalem which doesn't, um, uh, which has no, doesn't belong to any other religious group uh, as much as it does to the Jews. Now, that used, of course, that used the biblical narrative, um, the stories which m everybody in this room would know, will know um, about the Bible. And that, of course, is all about the Israelite people and their history and linking this to, as being linked um, by the Zionists to Jerusalem. And as a result of this, hand in hand with this, has gone this archaeological, uh, this, ar this archaeology, what I call Israeli archaeology, which is pr doing, pr trying to do uh, the same thing, but trying to find actual concrete evidence, uh, not just the biblical stories, but concrete evidence of a Jewish uh, presence, an ancient Jewish presence. Um, I might add that none has been found to date. Mm -hmm. However, the attempt continues. Um, now, there has been also, of course, a war over historical facts. Exactly what you would expect, and the sort of things we talked about in the first lecture, <coughs> that uh, um, uh, historical facts are disputed by the lobbyists for the Israeli side. They are uh, uh, put, to, uh, put into question. Um, uh, particularly, for example, the demography of Jerusalem. Who was living in Jerusalem and how many were they? And so you had a huge scholarship uh, employed by, uh, by Zionists to demonstrate that there was a Jewish majority of inhabitants in Jerusalem from the mid-19th century onwards. That is incorrect. It's not true. Mm. But no, it's not stopped them from putting this forward. Uh, and of course, the whole aim has been to Judaize the, 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 the place, to make, it, to make it really very, very Jewish. Um, you know, those of us um, t t t trying to teach this uh, has had really serious effects on the source material that you use. What are you going to recommend to students to read? Knowing that, and particularly with Jerusalem, a huge number of uh, of books, pamphlets, studies, and so on, are published precisely in the service of this alternative narrative. Uh, many of them purporting to be very scholarly, uh, many of them employing very long bibliographies. And f for people who are not used to the subject, who don't have expertise, uh, there are many pitfalls uh, and many dangers of getting the wrong idea. Now, when we look back, it's interesting that Jerusalem has been claimed uh, in a major way twice in its history. The claims I'm talking about is not a claim which says we, we, we have a, a link to Jerusalem, we have a religious sentiment about Jerusalem. I'm talking about a claim over the actual city, a claim of ownership. Now, f the first really 
a major claim in this way was of course the, the Crusader claim uh, which resulted in the Kingdom of Jerusalem which we'll talk about a bit later and in the 20th century it was Zionism. What these both of these had in common was that they were looking for ownership of of Jerusalem, not just saying this special to us, this is important to us, saying it belongs to us, ownership. Secondly, this ownership was exclusive. It said, this is the place of our group and only our group. Thirdly, of course, such an approach you can see permits of no diversity. Uh, and in the Crusader case, of course, it didn't work for very long because it was impossible for them to keep out the indigenous people. There were too, too few of them. In the Israeli case, this is working very effectively. And of course, what that does to Jerusalem is it disrupts and destroys the thing that makes it, uh, gives it its distinctive character, that it is made up of a religious and social mosaic which makes it such a unique city. Now, we obviously must, in a talk like this, uh, me, uh, deal with the, the religious affiliations that this city has aroused. And by order, in order of age, clearly the first is Judaism. Why? Well, now here uh, uh, we, we have to go to the Bible to get the story of a temple erected by Solomon, the son of David, um, uh, uh, 962 BC. I use, I still use, I'm very old fashioned, I still use before Christ BC and AD. I do not like common eras at all. So I don't honestly know who, who they're common to because it's still, it's still to do with the birth of Christ, whether people like it or not. So that's the reality. Anyhow. So the Temple of Solomon, 962 BC. Now, this temple was destroyed, uh, in fact, more than once. Uh, it was destroyed in a major way in 587, but then again built again in 57, uh, 575. And then it was destroyed yet again in 170 BC, and it was rebuilt by a non-Jew, King Herod, mm -hmm. uh, uh, for the Jews, but he himself was not a Jew. Now, this uh, last temple was destroyed again by the Romans in 70 AD. All that remains of it, as far as we can judge, was a wall which was not the wall of the temple, but was the wall of the platform, the enclosure, which had the temple in it. And this part of the wall, this is the western wall of that enclosure, is the one that is the Wailing Wall uh, and survives uh, uh, where of, of great uh, importance to, to Jews. Um, of course, Jews always prayed for a return to Zion. Zion is Jerusalem. Always, prepare, uh, always prayed for that. But this was, of course, a spiritual prayer. This was not about an actual return, a physical return. And of course, Jerusalem has always been a spiritual center for Judaism and a place of pilgrimage. So here we have this Solomon's Temple uh, reconstructed in, in, a, in, in the artist's imagination as how the temple might have looked. And this isn't as harmless as you think, because there is there are extremist groups, ultra-religious Jews, in Palestine, Israel, uh, who genuinely believe that this, the temple, Solomon, should be rebuilt, uh, and on the site that they ascribe to it, which is beneath uh, the uh, Haram al-Sharif, the Temple Mount, of course, that would mean that the Islamic structures on the top, these mosques, would be uh, destroyed, but then this is the restored temple. This is what it would look like in imagination. Of here is the Western Wall. <coughs> Not a very clear slide, but here's the Western Wall with Jews praying at it. And here's a historic photograph of the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem in 19, about 1927. You can see uh, Jews praying there. And the Western Wall, here's another view to show you where it is in relation to the Dome of the Rock. Um, 
Christianity, well need I say, of course, Christ's birth, the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem, the site of uh, Jerusalem, uh, the, uh, the site of Christ's crucifixion, um, the burial in, supposedly in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. So many places in, associated with Christ in and around Jerusalem, the Via Dolorosa, the Garden of Gethsemane, the Mount of Olives, and 38 other churches at least. There is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, um, rebuilt, destroyed and rebuilt, um, and added to over centuries. Um, Church of Nativity in Bethlehem, people who've seen this will remember what it looks like. There's the Via Dolorosa in the old city. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, I always think that if you want to look at uh, the, the links, the religious links to Jerusalem, the strongest link, in my view, is the Christian one. Mm. It is the Christian one. That is where the essence of, of Christ's life, his message, the essence of Christianity, is played out in, in Palestine and particularly in Jerusalem, unlike uh, Judaism and unlike Islam. And that is, that is, that is the truth. Uh, however, as you m may have been aware, if you follow the news, the least active against the Israeli government's actions on the, in destroying Jerusalem, mm -hmm. the least active has been, have been Christians, and particularly the church in this country, the exactly. Anglican church, the least active. Now, Islam, important, Jerusalem, very important uh, in Islam. <coughs> in Arabic, its first name was Beit al-Maqdis, the, the, the house, the home of the holy, Beit al-Maqdis, and then later, in 977, it was changed to Al-Quds, the, the name by which it is known today, Al-Quds. And of course, I'm running through this. You know that's the site of the first Qibla in Islam, the first direction of prayer. It's a place of pilgrimage. In fact, uh, it is enjoined on Muslims uh, who, are off, who are going to go to the pilgrimage in Mecca to do the pilgrimage to Jerusalem, either before or after, usually before. Um, uh, of course, we have physical evidence of the Islamic link, uh, um, the, the, the Haram al-Sharif, what is called the Temple Mount for Jews, with on it the Dome of the Rock, Al-Aqsa, the one we saw the, the picture of. And of course, it is also linked, Jerusalem is linked to Muhammad's night journey, this um, <coughs> legend, because it is a legend. Uh, where Muhammad uh, was brought on his magic steed, the horse called Al-Buraq, uh, to Jerusalem, from Mecca to Jerusalem, and he tied his steed, Al-Buraq, to this same wall, the Western Wall, which is in Arabic known as Al-Buraq, the wall Al-Buraq, not uh, Wailing Wall. And of course, you know, uh, of course, 1400 years of continuous uh, Islamic history, living history in, in the city. Here is the Temple Mount, the Haram al-Sharif. Um, there is the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Um, <coughs> now, so there are, we have therefore these religious associations and a powerful, really powerful significance. It has such a strong significance for these three um, religions. Now, Jerusalem's history has been anything but quiet. It has endured 20 sieges. It's been destroyed no less than 17 times. It has suffered earthquakes, uh, some of which have destroyed some precious historical structures, and has been the site of many battles and massacres. Mm -hmm. And conquests, it's been conquered again and again. Uh, the Crusaders is, I'm only going, I'm talking about modern times, because before that you have to talk about the Romans, and then you have to talk about all the people before them. But from the Crusades on, the, the, uh, the, the um, sorry, not from the Crusades on, but you have the Crusades, and you have the Arab conquest, and then you later you had the Ottoman conquest, then you had the British, and then you had the Zionists. And the Arab and Ottoman period, because it was such a long period, gave Jerusalem its distinctive physical character, its architecture. Now, anybody wanting to talk about ancient Jerusalem, because if you want to run, down, uh, run through 
Jerusalem's history. You obviously have to start in, in, in ancient times. Well, here you have the most acute form of the battle that I was talking about. Because you see, from the Zionist point of view, the only validation possible to this ownership, ownership of the city, uh, has been the Bible. Now, it's been extremely important to uh, apply the Bible, to, to find the evidence of the biblical narrative in physical terms, in archaeological terms. And hence, not only do you have a problem of sources when you come to actually study ancient Jerusalem, um, you, you have, maybe some of you do, have every idea of huge literature, really, on biblical Palestine, the Palestine of the Bible, biblical this, biblical archaeology, it's massive. Um, but all, uh, not all, m the majority of these works are designed to promote the Jewish character uh, in, in these ancient times. But in reality, uh, and of course biblical archaeology, by that I mean that form of archaeology which grew up in the 19th century and was not started by Jews, by the way, or Zionists. It was started by devout Christians who were very, very keen on uh, proving the veracity of the Bible. And so there was this caricature of the archaeologist in the 19th century with a spade in one hand and a Bible in the other. Uh, the, 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 about the worst that you can do if you're trying to make any sort of scientific investigation. However, that's what happened, and of course it's been carried on enthusiastically by Israel. Uh, in, but when we look at what evidence do we really have about ancient Jerusalem, because it's very, very little. It's very little. It you know, shreds. Mm -hmm. So we, f we learn the first evidence we have is in, a, in a, an, Egyptian, um, an Egyptian source uh, f dating from the 8th century BC. And in the 4th century, uh, we, we, we learn of something called Urusalem, which is this place, which is described as a city with a king on a hill, but it was of course under Egyptian rule. And Salem, the Salem of that n name, is not peace. It's not Salam or Shalom. It's Salem was the Canaanite god of the city. Uh, he was the patron god of the city. And uh, so that's what it derives from. Um, now, as far as we know, the, the, the people who lived in, in Jerusalem were Canaanites, whether they were a subgroup called Jebusites. The Jebusites only appear in the Bible, but they, they almost certainly must have been part of the same group, the Canaanites. And we know that they had a religion, uh, and that religion and a lot of that religion was adopted by the Israelites and entered into Judaism. So um, th their chief god was the god Il, or otherwise known as El or Elohim. Now, w fascinating, of course, because those among you interested in this kind of thing will pick up how Il persists in, anybody? Common names, Christian names, so-called Christian names. No? Samuel. Well, even more common, Michael, oh, Michael, because it's Mikael, oh, uh, and, and J Gabriel is Jibra'il, <coughs> and uh, Israel <coughs> is Israel, <coughs> and Yale, you know, Yael. I mean, it's all over the place. Be and it, it, it all comes from this god, Il. Uh, and so it was adopted by the Israelites. Now, there is a, a body of scholarship which says that one, the, the, the god, Il, who was the main god, had, um, of course, various sons, and one of them was called Yahweh. And this Yahweh was adopted by the Israelite group as their god, their personal god. And that was something that, that happened a lot uh, with Canaanite worship. Uh, people took their own lo local gods, but usually connected to or derived from Il. Right, well, okay, we'll run through the biblical story, how we do it. With yeah, the biblical story. Um, thousand, uh, in 1000 BC, David united the, the, these two um, Israelite tribes, warring tribes, Judah and Benjamin, 
and established uh, the, a kingdom, David's kingdom, um, and it was uh, the kingdom in, um, encompassed uh, a number of uh, city-states, Canaanite city-states, and uh, David's uh, the major city was Jerusalem, and um, he, uh, David, brought the Ark of the Co Co Covenant to Jerusalem. And so in that sort of handover from one religion to the other, the Salem's <coughs> temple, the old temple devoted to the worship of Salem, became Solomon's temple and uh, where the, the Ark of the Covenant um, existed. And, um, um, <coughs> uh, you know, it's, um, it's, it's, it's caused, although we look at this, we, there is no evidence for any of this. I mean, I, 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 have to, I have to emphasize, there is no independent evidence other than the Bible of this story. However, you can see that it's almost as if the statement I've just made is irrelevant because mm -hmm. it has so entered the minds and souls of people that uh, the biblical story is very important, it's the true story. And I was just thinking <coughs> when I was drawing up these slides, thinking it's Christmas and we'll soon be singing once in Royal David's City. So, I mean, how on earth is anybody ever <laughs> going to stand aside skeptically mm -hmm. when you have this, uh, this level of fam familiarity with these stories? <coughs> uh, here we are. I think he looks very splendid. That is a representation of King David of Israel. Uh, and this, here we are, an artist's impression of how the ark looked. So, all right, so running on through with this potted history, um, the Arab conquests. I know I've missed out um, the, the Christian, early Christianity and the Romans and early Christianity and so on. But, uh, you know, um, something I want to say at this point, it's very important for, 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 um, for there to be an understanding that the story of Jerusalem's people is not a story of uh, a population that sort of gives way to uh, the second lot of population and then gives way to another lot of, of people. It's not, of course, like that. What in fact happened was that the same people, the indigenous people, originally Canaanite, um, um, came under Israelite rule and then, um, and then they became Jewish and then <coughs> Jesus Christ um, or Christianity appeared and most of them, not all of them, most of them converted to Christianity leaving a minority which are the Jews, a minority uh, who re remained in Palestine, the indigenous Jews. And then with the Arab conquest in 638, uh, 638 uh, AD um, in time and a majority of, of them again became Muslims, leaving a minority which was Christian. So, you know, that's how it goes. And in time, they became, the inhabitants of Jerusalem became Arabized and Islamis, fully Islamicized, uh, bar, as I said, those, that minority which did not. And um, so it went on, really, uh, until 1948 when something major happened, but we'll talk about that later. Okay, so uh, in 638 AD, the Arab conquests, uh, Omar, the second caliph, the commander of the Arab armies at the time, and uh, there are many stories about Omar, uh, very much relating to how just he was, how scrupulous he was, that when he came into Jerusalem, he um, uh, made sure this so-called covenant of Omar that the people of Jerusalem would not be harmed and those who wished to become Muslim could do so and those who did not wish to would not be harmed and he refused to, invited by the Archbishop of Jerusalem to pray, he refused to pray at uh, um, the site uh, at the, uh, uh, sorry, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre because he said this will create a, a big problem and I will just pray in a quiet uh, modest place here, and that place became uh, was a, so became the they built the dome of the of the rock um, on that place in six nine one. Now, 
after the, uh, the, the first dynasty, Islamic dynasty, was the Umayyad dynasty, uh, which dynasty stressed the importance of, of Jerusalem, became extremely important. It was uh, Umayyad rulers who built the Dome of the Rock in 691. It was an, another Umayyad uh, uh, caliph who built Al-Aqsa Mosque. Um, and you see how early these buildings are. An earthquake actually damaged the Al-Aqsa, but it was rebuilt and made Jerusalem uh, a center of Islamic pilgrimage. And the Abbasids continued as the next dynasty. They continued the same tradition, stressed the sanctity of Jerusalem. Here is a close-up of the Dome of the Rock, which I think you will agree is a terribly beautiful building. I don't know how that comes across to you. And here is another, I think, a beautiful view of the Aqsa Mosque. Um, now, uh, we have many historical accounts of the situation in Jerusalem under, at its zenith under Islamic uh, Arab rule, uh, Islamic uh, Arab Islamic rule in the 11th century, we have descriptions of what a rich spiritual and cultural life there was in Jerusalem. It was a center for Sufism. Sufis and mystic scholars came from everywhere. There were many shrines. It was also a center of Islamic jurisprudence and seems to have had a population at the time of 20,000, it's quite a lot of people, and had thriving markets with craftsmen and dyers and tanners and so on, and um, money lending and so on was in the hands of Jews, and the Christians often made, uh, often became doctors uh, or secretaries or other administrators. Right, uh, uh, so, um, rattling on, <laughs> is the next, uh, and I think probably very, very famous episode in Jerusalem's history, and that's the Crusades. Mm -hmm. um, now, I wish we had time, because the Crusades have deserve uh, a full lecture, or at least one or more, because it's such a, an extraordinary phenomenon, the Crusader phenomenon, and has well, a complex, we now know it had complex reasons for happening, and its effects were widely felt. So the Crusaders uh, in the First Crusade took it upon themselves to capture the city of Jerusalem, uh, which they, they did in 1099 and made the most, uh, in so doing, created mayhem and murder, uh, extreme violence. Jerusalem at the time was under Fatimid rule. The Fatimid dynasty uh, was, was ruling from Egypt. And the Islamic world at that point was pretty disunited. There was, it, was not, uh, it, it was not able to withstand this assault from outside. Uh, uh, and in these massacres, Muslim, many m m Muslims were killed, Jews were killed or expelled. Mm -hmm and the Kingdom of Jerusalem was established, sorry, that should be a D, uh, which included, which was quite a big kingdom because it had a lot of, uh, of towns and cities within it. It wasn't just Jerusalem, in, uh, particularly Acre, it's an important center. And then, um, again, this is all these facts are known to all of you. In 1187, uh, Jerusalem was recaptured by Saladin. Again, a story that has been uh, written about, talked about, the subject of romances, and in fact a rather interesting film, I don't know if anybody see it, mm -hmm. called something like uh, The Doors to Heaven or uh, Heaven's Gate or something like that, the king, ah, Kingdom of Heaven, that's it. I don't know if anybody saw this, it's quite a recent film. Really? It, was, it was really, really very interesting and it cast a Syrian actor, a, a real Arab, an Arab actor in the role of Saladin and not somebody with boot polish on his face. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so anyway, from that moment on, um, the Islamic world uh, rose up, and after Saladin, uh, various uh, other campaigns against the Crusaders, and finally, Acre was recaptured by a Mamluk general in 1291. And so that was the end of that enterprise. Um, now, so if we rattle on again with this uh, extremely rapid history of this story, um, the Ottomans, 
uh, as you know, the Ottoman Empire was established in 1516. Uh, now, be just before it, between the Fatimids and the, and the Ottomans, there had been a number of Islamic dynasties, uh, um, Ayyubids, um, Mamluks, and, uh, and finally the, 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 the Turks um, uh, were the new conquerors uh, in 1516. Uh, and they ended Mamluk rule in Jerusalem. Now, although, you know, uh, we, of course we're talking, I'm talking because I'm going through this rapidly. Although these various Islamic periods uh, politically were politically unstable and, uh, you know, um, m much has been discussed and written about the way they ran the Islamic State, as far as Jerusalem is concerned, each one of these dynasties built beautiful buildings in Jerusalem, which survive. So you have the most wonderful Mamluk architecture, beautiful Ayyubid buildings, even Fatimid uh, doorways, and you can see them uh, very, very beautiful. So uh, in terms of beautifying Jerusalem, they all wanted to do it. <coughs> they all did it. Now, for, for, from the point of view of the city, Suleiman the Magnificent, the second Ottoman Sultan, um, was responsible as a, 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 a man who found Jeru was very, very um, um, interested in Jerusalem, wanted to beautify it and so on, and built the wonderful walls of Jerusalem, which make what you know, which you've seen, from 1535 to 1538. Uh, and then uh, the sort of modern era began in 1604, when the Ottoman uh, Empire started these capitulations to Western powers. So French missionaries appeared in Jerusalem in 1604. And later on again, uh, Napoleon, who, who had tried, tried to conquer Jerusalem, but failed in 1799. Nevertheless, this was another very important event in this eventful history. There, Suleiman the Magnificent. I think it's a magnificent painting of him, actually. Um, and there, there are the walls of Jerusalem, beautifully lit up. Um, and they, they really are lovely. And you know, one of the things you, you see in modern day Jerusalem, because of this need on the part of the Israelis to demonstrate a, a physical link, uh, with Jerusalem, they will take you to a part of of this of this uh, of the old city and part of the wall uh, uh, to something called the Tower of David, and 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 really people go along and look at this, um, and I I think many of them, but devout Christians, uh, not just Jews, really think that that David was linked somehow with this Ottoman wall. Anyway. Um, Okay, so now we come to the modern era, uh, the one where we see, if you like, the, the way that the, the ground was prepared for the entry of the final conquerors, that is the Zionists. Uh, Jerusalem is a city that has known many, many conquerors, many, throughout its long history. But there were two instances in which the conquerors did not just conquer the city with the aim of ruling it, they conquered it with the aim of replacing its population with their group. And that was the Crusades, which we skimmed through just now, but you know, it wasn't very su su successful because they, um, uh, they couldn't keep out the um, indigenous people. But the second attempt, which is much more successful, is Zionism. Mm -hmm. And that uh, is something which is, I think, important to bear in mind, that in a long history of not just Jerusalem, but Palestine, until 1948, what was happening was that there were various historical, in a historical period, there were conquerors, different conquerors, different rulers, different arrangements for Jerusalem but mm, a continuity of its population, a continuity of its population. People who were Canaanites and then who became Jews and then who became Christians and then became Muslims in a natural progression, a succession, an evolution. In 1948, 
departure from this happened, something extremely unusual, un unprecedented in Jerusalem's history, which is the actual, that actual continuity was disrupted and destroyed by as the last conquerors, the Zionists. Now, le but let's go back. In, in, in the early, in, in the, in the um, uh, 19th century, uh, uh, the British consulate, the first British consulate was established in Jerusalem in 1831. Now, the, uh, the consulate was established not just in order to bring in European merchants and trades and so on, missionaries of course came in, but also because the people who were very active in promoting this were also very active in uh, promoting the, the, the brackets, the return, um, quote, the return of the Jews. Because these were Christians of a particular type who believed that literally the, the Bible is the literal word of God and in the Bible it says that the Messiah will come again when the Jews have been returned to uh, Palestine, to Jerusalem, and when they convert. And that is when the second coming, that was when the Messiah will come. These people were inspired by this biblical idea. And so they were very keen on a Jewish return. This is before political Zionism, long before. So they paved the way for what happened afterwards. And as 1922, the British mandate uh, was established after the end of the First World War. And of course, that, that the mandate, as everybody here knows, uh, uh, was the, the, the instrument by which the Zionist movement was admitted into Palestine. Um, Jerusalem became the capital of Palestine under the British. The British made it the capital and facilitated the entry of Zionism. Uh, and so by 1947, uh, you know that's the, the rest of the story which we talked about the last time, um, the British couldn't, had to, wanted to give up the mandate and the UN took it up and so produced the partition plan which separated, which gave Palestine, divided into an Arab state and a Jewish state, but Jerusalem had a special status. It was called the Corpus Separatum. It was a bit like the Vatican. It, that's how they envisaged it, because it was too important to the three major religions to be given to one side or the other. Now, the Corpus Separatum <coughs> never actually happened in actuality, ever, uh, because uh, in 1948 to 49 war, Israel conquered West Jerusalem and called it, and called Jerusalem, started to call it the capital of Israel. And then in 1967, the rest of Jerusalem was conquered by the Israelis, um, which is the situation we have today. Right, and here is Israeli Jerusalem. If you look at the green uh, color, those are remain, that's what remains of the Arab areas of East Jerusalem. This was an entirely Arab city, remember, before 1967. This is what happened. Look at the blue, light blue, dark blue, all of those are Jewish settlements. And here is another view of Israeli Jerusalem, and you can see the settlements there in the blue. These are the major big settlements. Um, here is a big settlement, that's how it looks for those who haven't seen it, and here is another view of a huge settlement that's um, uh, in, in around Jerusalem. Okay, so the rest of the story is soon told. It's, uh, it's very sad for Jerusalem, there's a very sad story for Jerusalem, because the drive which uh, the Israelis uh, had and, and brought with them was to make the city mono-religious, uh, that it had only one religion, one history, one historical presence, not the mosaic that Jerusalem had been, but this other thing. So they did that by confiscating land, building settlements, and they encircled Jerusalem with two rings of settlements, brought in 200,000 Jews to settle it, and 
managed in a relatively short space of time due to bringing in Jews and expelling Arabs, they reversed the demography of Jerusalem from an Arab city to one where 72% are Jews and 28% are Arabs. And this, uh, the Ma'ali Adumim plan, the E1 plan, you see Ma'ali Adumim is a huge settlement, you can see it there in grey, in light grey. Now, if you look at the dark grey, this is the E1 plan. Now, people who've been following <coughs> the news will have um, heard or read that the Israeli Prime Minister announced uh, 30,000 new homes and the point is where, not only whether this was, a, of course, a settlement expansion, but where, where in East Jerusalem, and where in this. You see, this is this, the so-called E1 development that the Israelis have been preparing for for a long time. And you can see very, very clearly how it cuts the West Bank in, in two halves. The sea goes right up to the Dead Sea, and um, it cuts the West Bank into north and south without no contiguity between them. That is the E1 plan, which is being uh, uh, um, has been agreed uh, now with these new new housing units. And at the same time, the process of Judaization continues. And what does that involve? It has to involve the, er the eradication of the Arab physical and historical presence. It has to, because there was no Jewish physical presence. There, was, there are no Jewish buildings. There's no, as we were just talking about, there's no remains. There, what there is are Arab, uh, remember, whether Christian or whether Muslim. This had to be eradicated in order to make the other narrative work. And of course, at the same time, East Jerusalem has suffered a, a huge societal change because the Arabs of Jerusalem are separated from the West Bank, which was the normal, the natural area connect, of connection. Uh, and of course, it has led to a very interesting, we haven't, don't have time to go into a, fragment, a fragmentation of identity. If you talk to some of the people in East Jerusalem, some of them really are lost. They no longer, because of the, the, the f f fantastic campaign to delegitimize them and to make them feel to be actually non people, without a history, without a past, it's affected them. Uh, and many of them have turned to drugs. Many are impoverished. It's a very, very sad situation in Jerusalem. So here we are. If you look at the signs pointing you to Jerusalem, this is what you will see. You will see a Hebrew, and then you'll see the translation of the, he the, the transliteration of the Hebrew, Ur Shalim, which is the Arabic letters, and in brackets, Al Quds, the Arabic name in brackets, it's more and then of course you've got English. And uh, this is, um, this sums up I think the way that um, many Israelis feel it is the capital, Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. And before, before we end, I, I, I want to slightly dwell on Silwan. Uh, Silwan is a really um, important um, uh, story which sometimes makes it to the news and very often does not. Silwan is a village uh, outside Jerusalem, close to and just outside Jerusalem. It's a village of 40,000 people which until the, uh, the project to make uh, uh, Israel, um, Jerusalem Jewish uh, had been uh, farming people doing their, their thing. However, <coughs> there has, there, uh, in, from early 1990s, the idea of something called a City of David National Park was um, uh, developed. Now the idea of this is that David, in fact, was resided uh, in what is now Silwan. That's actually where he resided. And uh, so the plan would be to uh, clear uh, part of the village, uh, the part that, that then, then if you keep going, you will eventually get to the Jerusalem southern wall. And so that will be cleared and will become a national park, which is uh, David's, walk in David's footsteps type thing. 
and um, it's 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 you've no idea how far advanced this is because when I when I visited there, uh, I think it's a year ago. Um, y you have a, a kind of um, there's a, there's a there's a car park for the tourists who are going to come in, the Jewish tourists who are going to come in and enjoy uh, a slice of the Bible. And um, you come up to this thing and you have got uh, uh, buildings which are designated um, various things to do with David. One of them, which I particularly noted, was Bathsheba's bath. Really? And I, I, I mean, at the, at the time, this was a sign. I don't know what, what this bath would be, but th this, this is the sort of thing. Now, the idea then is that that becomes uh, uh, a Jewish, and it's been very heavily promoted as uh, reliving the Bible, etc. Now, the archaeology goes on, the digs go on underneath the old city, uh, so much so that fears have arisen several times and warnings that the ancient buildings on the Temple Mount, the Haram Asher, will not withstand that amount of digging underneath their foundations. Uh, none of it has made any difference. Um, there's Silwan. You can see it. You can see the, the little sort of blob there, and you can see the old city. And that whole area uh, between Silwan and the old city is to be cleared, is being cleared for this national park. There's Silwan, yes. typical Arab village. Um, and here's, here's the excavations. Just to give an idea, these are huge excavations. If you go there, they're really huge. And this is very scary. As a result of these intensive digging, the Israeli archaeologists have un unearthed a whole subterranean system of tunnels, which had been built presumably by the Romans or, or people just before them, uh, uh, under, uh, under the, 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 the Temple Mount. And but these tunnels had been closed for a long time and formed part of the solid foundation for the, for the Haram al-Sharif. Now, these have been opened so that the... Now, when the thing is finished, the tourists, the Jewish tourists, will be able to go from the city of David and go down into a tunnel because it will be, it'll, it'll go, it'll, they'll be able to, to extend the tunnels as far as they can and go into underneath the old city and then emerge in the Jewish quarter and then they will have had this um, biblical experience. But the terrible part about it is it's exposed, the digs have been so intensive, they've actually exposed a whole kind of skeleton of tunnels which are, um, anybody, anybody who's an engineer, engineer here will know that you can't do that because it, it's, it, uh, it subjects the structures above to um, uh, an unstable base. Mm -hmm. However, it goes on, and I'm sure you may have heard, I mean, UNESCO has passed numerous mm -hmm. resolutions asking the Israelis to desist. None of it has happened. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what are we going to, what, what was, what's going to happen with this? What is going to happen with this? Um, and as I said to you earlier, I think the tragedy here is for the city. This is a wonderful city, it was a unique city because it had this mosaic of peoples, uh, people living together with their different beliefs, their different places of worship, their different buildings that they created. Um, it was a whole social mix which was extremely interesting. All of that has gone. What you now can see is something which has become a Jewish place, um, largely, and continuing. So what, what are the prospects for, for, this, for this? Well, I, this is what I foresee, I don't know about you, that there will be a continuing conflict, mm -hmm. that the settlements will continue to expand. We're talking just as uh, we've just mentioned, uh, the Prime Minister and his announcement yeah. of more uh, housing units. Yeah settlement expansion, increasing Judea Judaization so that you really will not recognize the landmarks in the city any longer. Mm -hmm. um, and with the danger to the holy places we mentioned, and of course you, got, you have a religious war. Up until now it has not been a religious war except in a small way. It's been a war over territory. 
uh, and over uh, rights in the city. But inevitably and inexorably, this will become more and more a religious war. Already you've got these extremist, uh, ultra-Orthodox <coughs> Jews, and of course that excites a reaction from the other side. And so this is, this is what I see. So if when we, um, if we in, in, in questioning or discussion, I see we have some time, if anybody has a better idea, do let me know. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Vada. We, we, we can't uh, invite you to sit down because there's no chair. <laughs> uh, that, that, I think, was a wonderful uh, example of the exposition which Vada is known for, whether in her articles in The Guardian, or in her books, or in her teaching. Uh, and it's also a very good uh, illustration of how historical perspective and a historical vision is needed, really, to make the present understandable. Uh, I don't, however, want to say anything more about this myself. Uh, we have, I think, about 20 minutes for questions and comments, uh, and so if we can pass over to the audience for that, audience for that, audience for that, audience for that, audience 